It feels like Wednesday, right? <laughs> good morning and welcome to Wednesday. Lenaro Connect. Really good day yesterday. Lots going on. More to come today. Lots of good stuff on the schedule. Just a few housekeeping things and we'll get going on our keynotes this morning. The members' dinners tonight. It is a full event. Maxed out, but we are keeping a wait list. So if you're um, if you're still interested, give your name to Christine at the front desk, or you can send her email at this email address, and she'll put your name on the wait list. If you're on the wait list already, or if you put your name on the wait list, check in uh, sometime after lunch today. And um, uh, and if you're not going for any reason, and you're already on the confirmed list, please let Christine know, either in person or, or via email, so that we can free up slots for people on the wait list. Pretty simple, right? This is a shot of Sim Sashui on the lower right-hand corner. It is very Blade Runner-like if you've ever seen that movie. I mean, it's just an amazing place. There's so much going on there. We're going to have a great dinner uh, and the Hong Kong light show. The, lights in Hong the buildings in Hong Kong are, are all lit up. They have all sorts of colorful lights on them. They synchronize it to music. Uh, it's a very famous and fun thing to watch, and we'll be able to see it right from the restaurant. We're having Korean. There's Korean food tonight, so it should be a really good time. Uh, we just wanted to share a little bit of information on 96 boards. A lot of buzz on 96 boards going on here and externally. I think we've made a lot of waves here, and Steve just wants to share a little insight with us. So um, very quickly, um, yesterday we had about 80 requests for boards, and we've given those out. Um, one of the beauties of sharing these things is, and getting more hands-on things is you discover all the different ways people want to use 96 boards. Um, and we've discovered a few minor glitches in the Getting Started guide. Um, so we're adapting that now. If you have a 96 board, and um, we'd ask you to wait until lunchtime before you actually start using it. And we've got a special session this afternoon at 10 past four in this room with uh, Guo Dong, uh, the head of the uh, high silicon landing team, to actually help out with bringing up the board and things like that. Um, we also got about 130 requests for boards yesterday. Uh, so if you do still want one, put your request in in the next 45 minutes, and then I'll send an email out uh, telling people where they can pick up uh, their boards that they requested yesterday and today. Um, so 4.10 this afternoon if you want some help on bringing up the board. Thanks very much. Right. Thanks, Steve. So there is a scavenger hunt going on, and we wanted to share just a couple of the pictures that we got with you. But you need to submit a picture. So this is a picture of obviously the uh, the tux, the Connect tux on a 96 board, which is pretty cool. I'm not sure who submitted any of these, by the way. Here's another really great picture of collaboration at Connect. And so the submissions end tonight at midnight. So get your submissions in. The pictures need to be one of four categories. It only has to be one picture, a picture about collaboration from here. Uh, a great picture of Hong Kong, probably pretty good opportunities tonight for those going to the members' dinner. Uh, what Connect means to you, a picture that represents that, uh, or just to create a photo with the Connect Tux. And there is a drone at stake. I pleaded with Steve and Arwen to let me take out the drone and fly it around the room today so you would see it, but they were too scared that we would break it or something. But it's, it is really a, a great prize. So please submit. We're looking for more submissions, and uh, get your pictures in tonight. We have two keynotes today, one from Bob Monkman, who's going to talk about the impact uh, of ARM on cloud and network infrastructure. And then we have a keynote from GKS, GKH, I'm sorry. And if you know what, who GKH is, without saying anything, raise your hand. So to me, this is one of the smartest marketing moves ever, the smartest branding moves ever, OK? Linus has five letters in it, right? Share has four. GKH has it down to three, and everybody knows who's that, who's, who that is. So we're going to hear from GKH today. He always gives a really interesting talk at Connect, and we're looking forward to that. And so without any further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Monkman, who's going to tell us about networking in ARM. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? All right, very good. I'm fully mic'd. I'm going to switch over to my presentation. And so I think this is a pretty interesting topic. What is going to be the impact of ARM on cloud and network infrastructure? I talk a little bit about server and a, little, and a lot about networking in here. And this is a view that we've been 
developing at ARM. I've only got about 20 minutes, so I'm going to have to move through it pretty quickly. But uh, let, me, let me take a, a shot at getting through this in 20 minutes. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, we think that the ARM servers are ushering in a new era of what we call the workload optimized server. And we talk about the fact that at large scale, total cost of ownership is king. One size does not fit all. There's lots of different workloads that can be optimized for different computing and storage and, and acceleration platforms. And so the ARM business model and the ARM product range of products are uniquely positioned to deliver value in this new, this new uh, diverse world. And if we look back today and looking back, you know, we've already done a, a great deal of work to identify work, workloads that are really uniquely uh, well suited for the ARM SOCs of today. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but there's a lot of I.O. bound uh, workloads here. And this is really looking at like 32-bit, as a matter of fact. But it's moving forward as the 64-bit, many, many, many core processors begin to come out. We see a progression where today, you know, we're well, well uh, in, entrenched in storage. The web tier is a great application today. We'll go out to the cloud, out to uh, big data scale out, into analytics, into telco management, HPC and ultimately into enterprise servers and, and OLTP and so forth and so on. And so you've already seen previews of some of these kinds of devices that will take us uh, into the full range over the next few years. In the networking world, this is a, a view that, that we are developing uh, in ARM and it's not something that we're just making up. It's something that we have identified in the stories that are coming out of the industry leaders. And heretofore, we've seen a lot of intelligence at the ends of the network pipe, at the access layer, and now more and more so in the cloud and in the core. And the biggest fear of the network operators is they don't want to be relegated to being just a big, dumb pipe. They need to find ways to meet the demands of the huge tsunami of data that's coming at them. And not only do that more efficiently within, within cost structures that allow them to stay profitable, but how do they actually turn this around and begin to turn the network into a revenue generating machine? And so we, you're going to hear a lot uh, this year from ARM about the intelligent, flexible cloud. And it's a concept, as I said, that's not unique that, that, that we just identified uh, ourselves. It's really coming from what we see from the vision of the industry leaders. And we just happen to put this moniker on it, intelligent, intelligent flexible cloud. And what it, what it means is that we see the need for the network operators to drive more intelligence into the network bringing that intelligence closer to where it's needed, and then leveraging that intelligence to generate new revenue generating services, new applications that don't even exist today. And virtualization and the big movement towards open everything is really enabling this, this new paradigm. And what, it, what we see is that the, the ARM ecosystem is uniquely positioned to address and deliver on the vision of the intelligent, flexible cloud. Because what it means is that at the different points in the network, you're going to need different combinations of compute, storage, acceleration, and I.O. And so to give you a little bit more concrete idea of you know, how we see this playing out, we have here, I'm not going to go through all of these, but this just gives you an idea of the kinds of applications that we see moving forward that embodies this intelligence distributed throughout the cloud. And again, the virtualization concepts are really enabling us to 
put the intelligence where the data is and where the, where the, um, the opportunity to launch new kinds of services off of that intelligence. So it's really, really a big, big change in the industry. And again, uh, you can imagine that the ARM ecosystem is uniquely positioned to do that. I also spent a lot of time looking at the trends in software-defined networking and the initiatives around network function virtualization. industry standards group is now got new working groups and there's some very specific ones identifying how to standardize hardware accelerator abstraction and in the open NFE uh, open source collaborative working group run under the Linux Foundation you see projects Today, last night, uh, the Technical Steering Committee of OpenNFE approved for clearance moving forward the first data plane acceleration subproject within that working group to actually go out and explore the detailed requirements that will allow us to then move on to collaborative development to realize this notion of creating software interoperability on top of unique hardware, differentiated hardware, that has hardware accelerators, but allows software interoperability. So clearly, there's been sort of a, a high, this has moved to a kind of a hybrid realization that differentiated hardware, unique, innovative hardware still matters. And now the challenge is, how do you get that acceleration without having to have uh, you know, software vendor lock-in? How do you get it with with, with software interoperability. So that's the challenge moving forward. But it's really a, a great te you know, a testament to the recognition that, that innovative hardware still matters. And ARM, as I said, is uniquely positioned to do that. And a big part of the, the efforts in Lenaro around the server-based standard architecture and the open data plane initiative are driving standards that are going to enable the ARM ecosystem to deliver on this vision, but with software interoperability, both in terms of the server ecosystem and in terms of data plane, the interface to the data plane and the interface to hardware acceleration. And this is, I'm not gonna go into an overview uh, of ODP here today, but this is just a, a very simplistic view of how any application, data plane application can run on any SOC across multiple architectures and also across multiple configurations, big cores over PCI to NICs and highly integrated SOCs, many core SOCs. And we abstract out through the, through the API layer uniquely created vendor optimized implementations that allow that innovation to come through and deliver on acceleration, but giving a software, a common software interface to the virtual network functions above. This is the holy grail, and this is what's going to deliver, and, and uh, congratulations to the uh, Lenaro networking team to, to delivering on this vision. And I can tell you, uh, this is gonna be a year as we, as we go into the release of the 1.0 and start moving towards 2.0 of ODP, we're gonna be showing the, to the industry and to the world the proof points that we can deliver on that performance and deliver on that software interoperability. I was talking uh, yesterday to the Cavium guys about their implementation on their existing hardware today, and they have, they have proven and achieved 100 gigabits per second through aggregate throughput on an SOC running on ODP. 
So that's just, a, that's just a, an amazing accomplishment. And those proof points are going to keep coming with the other platforms as we start uh, rolling out these different implementations. So it's, an, it's a, a fantastic proof point of the kinds of, um, the kinds of a performance that can be achieved with software interoperable platforms that don't, don't take away the innovation. And so as these ARM servers and these ARM telco servers begin to come to market, we're going to, we, we, we say that we're gonna really upend the game. We're gonna change the game here and we're gonna deliver value in a different way. This is not going to be just a me too of bringing massive compute power uh, into, into racks of servers and just trying to get as much uh, power as we can without any other considerations like power and density. We'll leverage the value proposition of ARM, the low power, the high density, and we'll deliver a new way of realizing uh, the next generation cloud and networking infrastructure. And you've begun to see some of the proof points that have come out. Here's one that uh, you may have seen in, in many other presentations, the HP Moonshot system that has a number of ARM-based cartridges in it. And this is the idea, this is the kind of the new way of thinking. Traditionally, we're looking at infrastructure as just, you know, supporting business functions and delivering, you know, massive amounts of compute and storage. The new IT infrastructure is about driving business revenue. It's about TCO and it's about driving new forms of revenue. So yes, there's lower power, there's higher density, um, but also coupled with the software innovation that, that so the folks in this room are delivering in, in terms of the platform and the, the ecosystem out there, we're gonna be able to realize um, phenomenally new uh, you know, business paradigms, new business models, and new ways of making money off of the infrastructure and off of the network. If, again, just some proof points that I wanna run through, and I only have 20 minutes today and I wanna keep on, on track for, uh, for Greg. But some of the, um, the early 64-bit um, solutions from the ARM ecosystem that have come out, we've been able to develop some, some hard data and some proof points. And this is the kind of innovation and the kind of value proposition that's getting delivered. You see here on the left, you see a, 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 the fine print is difficult to read, but you're looking at um, uh, the, basically this web infrastructure and applications and memory cache and in order to deliver a certain amount of capability and capacity in today's infrastructure, you know, you need 120 nodes and three racks. In this new kind of high density, uh, you know, paradigm that the, the ARM ecosystem delivers, we can deliver that same kind of capacity in a single rack with 135 nodes and have a demonstrable reduction of the total cost of ownership. And for big scale out data centers, that kind of savings is huge. In Dusseldorf, we demonstrated with one of our partners and, and, and Ericsson and some other uh, ISVs, we, we, we looked at a NFE proof of concept. And what we were demonstrating was one of Ericsson's service provider edge applications, a real edge application that was running on a pure x86 server in one side and then on an x86 server, x86 server offloaded with a multi-core ARM-based network processor solution, the Axia platform. And it's a little bit hard to, to read uh, all the details here, but essentially what you're seeing is you're seeing the loading in both cases of the x86 server, one without an intelligent NIC based on, on the many-core ARM solution, where you see different traffic flows and what the CPU load is across 16 cores. The same application running with the offload, it basically consumes zero CPU cycles up to 20 gigabits per second for one workflow, or 40 gigabits per second on one workflow, and up to 120 gigabits per second on the other uh, workflow. In addition to this, what's not visible on this screen is 
they had another chart in real time while they were demonstrating this application at the SDN World Congress where they showed the throughput of the workflow. And on the left side, it was a high jitter performance level, lots of variance at one level. And then in the offload case, it was hard, straight line, completely deterministic, and nearly 10 times the performance. So again, this is the kind of value that unique hardware, accelerated hardware can deliver. And you can better believe that this has extreme value in the, ne in the network, especially if you can deliver it with software interoperability. So it's a great proof point. Here's another one that we developed at ARM in terms of some multimedia transcoding application. And again, what we were looking at is how could we deliver a certain amount of capacity, a certain amount of processing in a single box with traditional COT servers versus you know, many core ARM-based solutions. And you can see here the tremendous difference. If we were to try and deliver the same kinds of capacity and throughput of the transcode optimized server on the left with traditional servers, we would need 14 3RU servers to do it. And you can imagine what the power would be at that. So tremendous, tremendous capabilities in terms of changing the game and having new ways of delivering the kinds of, um, the kinds of services, capacity, throughput in a completely new way. And I'll just spend the last few minutes really just talking about some of the other amazing proof points that are coming out. The, the AMD guys have their 64-bit uh, processors coming uh, that are out now, the Seattle. They also have the networking uh, Hero Falcon example. This is going to deliver a, a lot of great value in the cloud infrastructure. We saw earlier in the week this slide about the 48-core Cavium Thunder processor. This is going to be another amazing platform Again, different families within, you know, different processors within that family suited to different kinds of applications. So again, delivering value across a range of workloads. The Freescale uh, solutions coming out, the Layerscape 1, the Layerscape 2, in the first case, you know, a really good platform for, uh, let's say, IoT gateways, for example, and then the Layerscape 2, um, based on A57s, is a, a, a more of a network, you know, more of a network packet processing uh, solution from Freescale. So lots of great proof points. And there are many more that I could go over today, but I definitely, you know, I just don't have enough time to go over them all. Here's another one, the Broadcom Vulcan. It was announced last year. You're gonna see SOCs based on this as well. So just fantastic, phenomenal, many core solutions. And the ARM ecosystem is going to deliver value in cloud infrastructure and networking infrastructure in unique and new ways using these kinds of solutions. And so, you know, hopefully in this short, you know, few minutes today, you've been able to get an idea of how we see how ARM is going to have an impact. Uh, again, it's going to be about delivering in this new paradigm, this new era of highly optimized, highly integrated workload optimized servers, the SDN concepts and the network function virtualization paradigm uh, enable this kind of intelligent, flexible cloud, and the ARM ecosystem is uniquely positioned to deliver value, as you can see in, in, with these kinds of proof points that we talked about. And it's not just about the business model, it's about the, you know, the, the technical design and the, the software that we can couple with it to take advantage of these many core architectures, giving, giving the operators the vision, delivering on that vision with a, you know, a tremendous amount of innovation and choice and flexibility. And then Lenaro is doing a phenomenal job in terms of delivering on the standards for the software ecosystem that are going to be needed to provide, you know, this to be able to take advantage of these unique architectures and deliver on that capability across different platforms interoperable, in an interoperable way. Lots of proof points coming down the line. And again, what we see is because of the unique value we bring, we're going to completely upend the landscape and change the game and show how you can do this in a different way. And the old way doesn't, we don't really have to do a me too entry into this space. We can do it 
the arm way, and it's going to be really, really compelling, fantastically uh, uh, performant with all the value proposition of, of, of the ARM ecosystem. So very, that's pretty much my view today. I wanted to thank you for your time today. I got a little picture here of Dave and I from the last Connect when we took a, a little uh, seaside uh, cruise in California in my 500 horsepower Chevy uh, Chevelle SS. Hopefully J Dave is, is watching, uh, staying up and watching and seeing this. Any questions? Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Greg. Um, this is my boring technical talk. My fun talk where I get to yell at you and say how bad you've been doing all year is on Friday morning. So come back for that one. <laughs> so Graybus. Graybus, um, first off, um, the project are a phone from Google. Um, Graybus is the hardware specification for how these modules talk to each other. Um, Google came to me about eight months ago and said, how would you write to write a specification for a new hardware platform without dealing with a spec committee? I'm like, yes. <laughs> so six months after that, we had working hardware and firmware and software. They went that fast. Um, it was amazing how fast they went. Um, because of that, to start with, I want to really, really thank, I didn't do this alone by any means, Lenaro um, did a lot, all the real work. Um, Alex Elder, Matt Port um, did real work. This stuff looked like USB before they came along and then made it work. So all the good stuff they added, the whole horrible stuff that looks like USB, that was me. Leaf Labs and Bay Libra firmware and kernel people, really, really good developers, did a lot of work. Google sponsored all this stuff and provided a lot of technical input. And Linux Foundation, I want to thank because they let me do this. So I'm just real happy. So, oh, and I have the phone. If you guys want to see it, touch it later on, um, just grab me. And then we're all hacking downstairs back in the corner if you want to see some big development boards. So let's talk about this. So Graybus is really Unipro. Unipro has been around for a long time, at least a decade. It's a point-to-point -point reliable data transfer. I think it came out in some Nokia phones, talking to the camera, talking to the display. But it was static, point-to-point um, -point stuff. It was, um, it was really good. It was reliable. It worked really well, robust. It's been around for a long time. So it's a good technology, a good physical transport level. And it works really good in mobile. It's very good, low power. It has a lot of good stuff. And there's some good specifications for it, for storage, UFS. UFS storage speeds are really, really fast for embedded, the fastest things out there. A CSI3, um, very good high-tech camera specification. That's out there. It's written. It's, it's there. We want to leverage that and use that. Um, so basically, Unipro is different from things like USB or PCI. USB is a star topology. Everybody talks to the host. PCI, it's a bus. Um, Unipro is this, bi-directional transfer. A module can talk to another module without having the processor in the way. We can set up some routes and let it go. And that's really important in a phone. You want the camera to talk directly to the display um, without having the processor to see all the data that goes through there. So that's one reason they use Unipro bi-directional communication, really, really fast. So you, get, you create a pipe between the two modules and the data just streams over that. Um, these pipes are called something. I'm gonna introduce some terms over as time goes on. We call these pipes C-ports. It comes from the Unipro specification. That's just the name. Think of them as a, as a socket, bi-directional socket. Really easy one. So, and they identify themselves. So we have a switch in the endo. endo. Switch sets up some routes and then we say, let the data go. Pretty simple like that. Um, features about this stuff. Um, really, really good feature is it's bi-directional, fast transfer between endpoints, and it's reliable. I send some data to it from the application layer, I know it made it to the other end. It's, a, it's all the retries, all the packet breaking up and stuff, it's all done in hardware, it works. Or I'm told it didn't make it, so at least I'll know. But it's a really good way. There's lots of built-in error handling. We have some credit-based flow control that's built into the system. I can say, prioritize this network traffic over that network traffic. And in our switch, they set up the routes and it all just works magically. Some other non-features though, it's not streaming. It's not a streaming data protocol. You have to send datagrams. So you just start sending a whole bunch of data. So it's a little different than that, um, than a net pure network protocol, but it works well. And there's no multicast. You can't sniff the bus and, and send to multiple devices at once. It's all point to point. 
So there's some pluses and minuses, but it works really, really good in a phone. This is really good stuff. Um, it really applies. Um, OS, Unipro works really good with the OSI seven-layer burrito model. Um, you ever seen that Taco Bell comparison to the, seven, to the OSI model? Um, physical, medium, all the way up. Um, the one problem with Unipro is there's no application level specification. So everybody started making up their own stuff. So that's why Google stepped in and said, we need to make a spec for the application layer. And that's why we're calling Graybus. We're working with the Unipro people to try and adopt it as something real. But until then, we can't call it Unipro because we're not Unipro. It's called Graybus. So let's talk about this. So Graybus, there's also some housekeeping you have to do in, in a system. Everything's dynamic. All devices need to describe themselves. So dynamically, we wanna, don't want to have static routes. We don't want to have device tree. We don't want to have ACPI. Everything has to be self-describable, just like USB and PCI is. We learn from our past. We don't want to reinvent static tables ever again. Never do it. Um, ugh. So um, we have to do some housekeeping, device discovery, describe the devices, network routing, and housekeeping like stuff. And then most importantly, the really important stuff is we want class protocols. Today with USB, you can buy any USB keyboard, plug it in, and it just works. Um, you buy any USB video camera, and it just works because there's a class specification. We're making class specifications for everything. That way, you buy a Wi-Fi module, you plug it in, no drivers needed. It'll just work. That's the goal of this thing. We're describing everything properly. And because we're not dealing with specification committees and politics and whatnot, we can make it work. So let's talk about some things. Device description. So again, every like USB, you have to describe the vendor and the product ID, the serial number, something called bundles. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we had to make up some new terminology because we didn't want to overload the USB terminology. So something called bundles. And then every descriptor describes the protocols that we use, how those endpoints or those C ports talk, what protocol we have on that thing. So let's look at this stuff. So some terminology. Modules. A module is a physical device. This is a module. Um, that's how the name is. Modules, if you look on some of these, there's multiple physical connections. Each one is an interface. That's a power, ground, all the data transfer. You can have two of these, some of these have four, some of them have one. This is what the kernel sees. The kernel sees an interface. They're logically independent, electrically independent. That's where we start operating on things. The kernel will tell you what the module is, so your pretty little GUI works, but interfaces are where we work in the kernel. Every interface has a control endpoint, or C port. C port zero, actually I think we're gonna renumber that and pick a different number, do this in spec work, but there's one control C port. Do the device descriptor, say power on, power off, handle some magnet stuff, all the housekeeping goes over that one C port. Just like USB, there's a control endpoint on USB. Same idea, C I stole from USB. Um, bundles, so here's what we're talking about. Bundles take C ports, and tie them together in a logical manner. This is so that one bundle zero on the left could be a Wi-Fi device. You have multiple data streams, a control port, that's a Wi-Fi. And then you can have next to that a battery, because a module that's the Wi-Fi can also have a battery in it. You can have eight batteries in this thing. Um, there's only one simple connection for that one, so that's. So bundles are where in the Linux kernel drivers bind to. And then the most simple ones, like a real bad, a big battery, just has one big bundle. So that's the logical translations. So bundles are what drivers bind to in the kernel module. Um, if you know USB, think of them as interfaces. We couldn't call them interfaces, but it's a overloaded term, sorry. So operations. Here's where things get good. USB, PCI, all these data formats just define, oh, we can open a socket or data and just start pumping data to it. Operations are something real. We want to do an RPC. I want to say to this thing, give me your version. I want to say, what is this thing? And then we have that. We have like function calls for this, these protocols, so operations. I send you something, you respond back. It's always request, respond, request, respond. And due to our high speed of how this stuff works, it works really well. We can take complex operations and distill them down to a really tiny amount of code. We're making very simple drivers to write, do the core can handle RPC. It's nice. You want to talk to these things in a simple way. Um, again, get version. Give me that back, data comes back. Vibrator on for your vibrator for your um, to notification. Just say, turn it on for so many milliseconds. It happens, it comes back and says, yes, everything was fine. Very simple operations. And then protocol classes. You can take these operations, 
bundle them all up, well, bundle, you take them all and put them all together and define a protocol. So we have a whole bunch of protocols we've already started with. We've implemented the simple ones, battery, vibrator, NFC, to see if this operations, this model works. Code's out there, it works. Um, some of them we don't have hardware for, but we simulated. The funny thing is, um, some of you guys have seen a bunch of developers posting pictures of a BeagleBone and a MinnowBoard Max. All this phone bring up was done on a BeagleBone and a MinnowBoard Max simulating all this stuff. Um, it's amazing what you can do with these BeagleBones. It's really, really cool. Laptop, BeagleBone, simulate everything. So we're creating next generation phones using BeagleBones. Fun stuff. Um, things that are working right now, audio, input. We're gonna steal the whole HID class from USB. Describe every type of input device in the world, just works. Sensors, IO, we're, all, we're gonna be working on all the sensors that you can possibly have. Camera, we got the CSI3 spec. We're working on that, tying that in. These are the ones they're working on right now. We got some more one stuff they're gonna have later as things move on. Wi-Fi, of course, is really big and complex. We're working on that. Bluetooth, cellular modem, GPS, lights, display. We're working on those things. But the first two sides, we have that stuff today. Today, you have a lot of hardware. You got a lot of chips out there. Wi-Fi devices, talk, USB, I2C, all this stuff. And we know people aren't gonna go rewrite the firmware for all these devices for a while. They're not gonna write their stuff to class devices. So we've decided to take a bridged PHY protocols. We're gonna fake everything out. So we have protocols for USB, I2C, GPIO, SBIO. All these things will tunnel through and come out the other side in the kernel. So that you, can have, you can hook up a USB device to, the, to one of these chips, and it'll plug in, it'll just tunnel right through and show up to the kernel as a USB device. It'll just work automatically. That's the goal of these bridge five protocols. Some of the protocols we didn't really have to do in the kernel. They're just tunneling them. We just had to set up some routes and say go, CSI, DSI. Those are nice. The kernel isn't having to do a driver. We don't sniff the data. We just set up things and everything works. So those, you won't see code for them in the kernel very much, but they're there because the phone works. That's nice, the firmware handles it all. And of course, all this code's been open since day one. Uh, it's on GitHub. Um, there's also firmware, there's simulator models out there. You can run it on the BeagleBone Max. It'll emulate the phone. You can run it on your laptop. Um, people have actually started sending some patches. People sent patches that broke things, which was good. <laughs> um, it's all been open. And then this whole specification is open too. You can go to Google's Project Aura site, download the specification. Um, it's still in flux. Um, you can download everything. They've opened up the hardware, the software, the firmware, the um, the model, the physical models, you can do 3D printing of this stuff, the electrical models, everything is all open. It's amazing what they want you to do with this stuff. So let's talk about how the kernel works. Um, we have a gray bus core in the middle. We do all the housekeeping stuff, the power management, tie into the SysFS, tie into the driver model, and there's a whole subsystem out there. That's all there, that's there today. Um, we have to talk to the Unipro network, a bridge controller. There's no standard Unipro host controller interface yet. So much so that we've already written three <laughs> for three different chips that are out there. We really want a standard. Um, we're trying to work with some hardware companies. If you are a hardware company that has one, talk to us. We want to make this standard so I don't have to write four, five, six ones of these. Some of them, we're actually talking across USB to Unipro. So if you look at it, we're actually telling USB over USB over Unipro. It's scary, but it works. Um, so we got that stuff out there today. Our upper layer is we have drivers that emulate battery sensors, then they talk up to the power subsystem and IAO, normal kernel interfaces. Android sits on top of that, sees that, and everything just works properly. We're tying in, we're not doing custom interfaces. Everything ties into the things we have today. And of course, for the bridge five stuff, USB tunnels through to USB, I2C, I2C, DPIO, all this stuff pops right out up, and it works properly like that. Um, everybody wants to know what they're gonna have to do with their drivers. Again, you plug in a USB device, you plug in a UART device, the kernel will populate that out to user space, out to the other kernel drivers, just work, no changes needed at all. That's amazing. So you can plug in your USB device or your USB chip on here, hook it up, no kernel changes, everything works. Um, that's a really, really amazing thing. Um, user space access is for I2C, GPIO, you can toggle things, you can write an Android application to read your I2C sensors. Um, I'm trying to make a little robot to do an I2C controller, uh, control that from user space. Everything works that way. Some things we all know, GPIO resources, SDIO resources, um, those things, um, you are gonna have to modify your existing kernel driver. We're working on that, maybe 20, maybe 30 lines is all you need to add, because you have to describe the hardware somehow. Um, it's really simple, we have working examples, um, and that's it, 20 lines of code to your existing working driver to get your Wi-Fi device working. 
is a pretty amazing thing. These guys have done some really, really good work. And I blew through 27 slides in 20 minutes. That's it. Any questions? Comments, heckles? You guys can see the device. We're around all week. That's it. Well, thank you very much.